Agastyamuni lived an extraordinary life and it is believed he also lived an extraordinary span of life. People, the legend says that he lived for four thousand years, we do not know. Maybe it was four hundred, being Indians, we take a little bit of liberty with zeros <laughs> because it's after all our invention, we can use it whichever way we want. You know, the zero came from India, so we use it little liberally because it's our… it's our intellectual property right. We can use zeros without tax. So we do not know exactly how many years, but looking at the travels that he did by foot, I have traveled much more than him but I jet, <laughs> he did it by foot. So looking at the amount of travel he did, he definitely lived an extraordinary span of life. We don't know, it might have been two hundred years, three hundred years, four hundred years, we do not know. But he lived an extraordinary span of life just looking at the distance he covered in his lifetime. If you go to the southern peninsula of India, Deccan Plateau as it is referred to, anywhere south of India Chal, if you go, almost every village you go to, people will say, Agastyamuni meditated here, Agastyamuni lived in this cave, Agastyamuni planted this tree, endless number of stories like this. Because he did not spare a single human habitation, he went to every human habitation <coughs> south of Himalayas and touched every human habitation and made spiritual process not as a teaching, not as a religion, not as some kind of philosophy, but just as a part of life. Simply as your mothers teach you how to get up in the morning and brush your teeth, like that spiritual process was taught. The remnants of that, even today, live in the culture, especially in the southern part of the country. In the north, a lot of it has been lost because uh, north took all the beating of invasions from the outside. The invasion, the military invasions, the cultural invasions, the religious invasions from outside were strong in the northern part of the country, but uh, they never usually came down beyond the Vindhyachal mountains. So south remained more protected just by the way the terrain was, the way the whole atmosphere was because both… all three sides is ocean. There were no great navies invading, it was usually army so they did not come that far down south. So even today you can see the remnants of this being practiced by common people unconsciously, not even knowing that it's a spiritual process. It's just a part of life. The way you stand, the way you do things, everything, the way you sit, everything has a spiritual basis but being practiced unconsciously, not being practiced consciously. If I go to a village somewhere in South India, it is true in many parts of North India too, an illiterate person, a completely illiterate person, if I go there, he will not uh, ask, I want a golden horse or something. He will say, Ayyayanaka mukti venangaya. He will say, I want ultimate liberation. Nowhere else on this planet is this possible. A completely illiterate person who has never read any scripture, he has never heard any spiritual teaching in his life, nothing. But he knows, Somewhere within himself, the culture has told him that he must seek for his ultimate liberation. That means he must seek for a dimension beyond his present existence, the way it is right now. This awareness got so deeply built into the culture that knowingly, unknowingly, people started seeking it. So today it has become too much unknowingly, in spite of eight to ten generations of absolute poverty, you will still see there is a certain sense of balance, a certain sense of joy, a certain sense of contentment in them 
which you rarely see anywhere else on the planet. In spite of almost ten generations of absolute deprivation on the material level. So this work that Adiyogi did, in terms of contributing to human consciousness, no other being has ever made such a huge contribution because the technologies for evolving human consciousness, he laid it out so clearly that it does not matter in how many ways you look at it, you cannot come up with one new thing in your life. It is just you can only repeat what he has said. Whatever you think is a brilliant idea, if you come up with it, you will see he said it over fifteen thousand years ago. What Charles Darwin said two hundred years ago, which is a revolution in human thought that life can evolve from one dimension to another is an absolute revolution. But this did not happen two hundred years ago. This happened a few thousand years ago, Adi Yogi clearly said, whatever the nature of life right now, if you give it a possibility, it can evolve into a completely new dimension that you cannot recognize the previous form. To that extent it can evolve. Without… he said it so categori categorically, he did not leave any ambiguity about it. When Charles Darwin said it, there was ambiguity about it. People could argue with it. Adiyogi did not leave any room for argument. He said, this is the way life happens. And if you do not know this, from this basic aspect of yoga, this is the reason why every yogasana is named after an animal. Do you know this? Hmm? Almost every yoga posture that you practice is named after an animal because it is the science of evolving yourself. And when we say, from this evolved what is considered or referred to as the avatars, the nine times, the nine different forms in which the divine appeared, the first form was fish, the second form was a turtle, the third form was a boar, a wild boar. The fourth form was half man, half animal. The fifth form was a dwarf man. The sixth one was full-fledged man. The seventh one was a much more evolved man. Eighth one was an extremely meditative man. The ninth one was a pure loving and meditative quality of a man. These things were said thousands of years ago. Charles Darwin or Darwin's theory of evolution is one hundred percent in line with this expression of divine finding manifestations in the form of a fish, that is life within water, turtle, half in, half out, amphibious, then a wild boar which is solidly grounded animal, then half man, half animal, then a dwarf man, then an evolved man, a fully evolved physical man, an angry man. Parashuram is one of the avatars, a very angry fighting man. The next one is a loving man, the next one is a meditative man. Like this, this was given thousands of years ago. Why I'm saying this to you is, this possibility that a human being can evolve beyond his present limitations is the most significant thing that needs to be planted in human mind right now because he's empowered like never before. He cannot afford to be stupid anymore. Hmm? He's empowered like never before. He just cannot afford stupidity anymore because when you are not empowered, if you are stupid, it's okay. The world can take it. If you are a little ant, you could crawl on anybody you want. Suppose you grew up into a huge elephant, 
Now, please don't crawl on anybody you want, because <laughs> wherever you walk, destruction will happen. So, a human being is becoming more and more powerful, but unfortunately not more and more sensible. In today's world, for the first time, for the very first time in the history of humanity, today we are empowered enough to address just about any problem on the planet. We have the needed resource, capability and technology. We can address and fix just about anything on the planet. This was not even possible twenty-five years ago. This, I want you to understand this, this is for the very first time in the very history of humanity. Such a possibility, such a capability, such levels of resource and such technologies never ever was possible. This is for the very first time. At the same time, we also have the capability for the first time, if we want, we can split the planet Earth into two. Yes? We have enough explosive power with us, if we put it in the right place, we can actually break the planet into two or into many pieces. We are even capable of that. That is also for the first time. So in terms of what we can do to make everything wonderful here, we are capable like never before. In terms of how to make everything absolutely horrible on this planet, we are capable like never before. In terms of obliterating the very life of the planet, also we are capable like never before. Now what we are going to do is essentially going to be determined by how much investment are we going to make to raise human consciousness? How much investment are we going to make to make this idea that a human being can move into a, another possible dimension, into a reality in our lives. Right now, the investment towards that is uh, almost nil. No government in the world is investing anything, no society in the world is investing anything much. Individual human beings here and there doing a little bit, but no organized effort to raise human consciousness is happening, isn't it? And when human beings are so empowered, not raising human consciousness, trying to solve problems, the mind and the mindset which created the problems, with the same mind and the same mindset, trying to find a solution is the most idiotic thing to do. The kind of mind and the kind of mindset which created all the problems on the planet, the same mind and the same mindset is claiming that it will find solutions. It cannot find solutions, it can only create more problems. So, investing towards making this idea into a reality that a human being can evolve into another dimension, a human being can leave his limitations behind and rise above this. We need investment in that direction, both in terms of human resource and other resource. This needs to happen in a big way, otherwise all of us are going to regret. All of us are going to regret in a very bad way or we may not live to regret. That is also possible.